Hello, everyone, and welcome back to class. We uh, obviously just took the midterm, so that is quite fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry, just setting up my timer here so we don't go over time. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the midterm. Um, if you have any comments about the midterm, uh, the format, or you know anything related to kind of the, the administration of it, uh, please post that on the discussion section for uh, this week. So we're in week, uh, week 12, so for the week 12.2 discussion, uh, post in there and uh, you know we'll be able to address that. So if there's anything that was kind of confusing uh, or you know something that you really liked, please let me know and I will either be able to, to try and work something out to, to make the tests a little bit uh, more understandable, I suppose you could say. So now we're moving into our next portion of the class. Uh, so we have gotten into part three, as you can see here, and of course on the screen. And I discovered this laser pointer thing, so we're going to be employing that. Uh, that's pretty neat. So yeah, we're in uh, week 12 right now, the end of week 12, and this is the final chunk of the semester. So we are going to be covering all the way from uh, Alexander the Great, which is today, and going all the way into the fall of the Sasanian Empire and the rise of Islam in the mid seventh century. So uh, what I saw of the exams, a little bit more on that, um, it seems to be that it went pretty well. Uh, you know, mind we're only, uh, I'm recording this on Tuesday, so we're only a day off. But it seemed to have gone well, so I hope uh, you know you all enjoyed taking the test in the comfort of your own home. Uh, and yeah, we may be doing the same uh, format for the final exam, uh, which again is just only going to cover weeks 12 to week 16 to our very last week. So from now on, everything you learn from now on is going to be on our final exam. So we're not asking you to remember stuff from before. But we're either going to do the same type of exam or we might change it up a bit. So we're still kind of working on the details uh, with that. But Yes, let us start with Hellenistic Western and Central Asia. So we are going to uh, be looking at a few parts of Hellenism. And uh, today we are going to be looking at the uh, start of Alexander the Great's empire and moving into Ptolemaic Egypt. So we'll be looking at uh, that famous site of Alexandria. And we'll be looking at uh, a lot of really interesting things about, uh, about Alexander the Great. Now, the next class is going to be on the Seleucids, uh, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on the Seleucids than the other portions of the Hellenistic empire, uh, empires that followed Alexander, Alexander, mainly because they are the ones who controlled Western Asia. So, looking at the land that Alexander controlled, he started off in Macedonia, and uh, through a series of major battles, completely and utterly destroyed the remnants of the Achaemenid Empire under Darius III. Uh, and once they destroyed, uh, destroyed the Empire of Darius, Alexander moved into, uh, way up into kind of Central Asia here at modern Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, and Turkmenistan and then came down into India, where his soldiers kind of, as the story goes, they got homesick and essentially wanted to return home. So they returned home and Alexander made it all the way to Babylon, the city of Babylon, which we have talked about many times before. Uh, and that is where he died. So Alexander himself, uh, the family that he came from, I uh, basically claimed to have descended from uh, Zeus and Heracles, uh, the Latin Hercules. And that is kind of where we start to see uh, the development of this royal cult. So where the, the royal figure, the king, uh, becomes a divine figure, a divine figure, a god in and of themselves. Uh, and as you can see here, this is a uh, Roman copy of a Greek original, and this is Alexander uh, depicted as the god Zeus. So he's holding Zeus's scepter, 
uh, and the lightning bolt, as you can see here, we have his scepter, and uh, the lightning bolt in this hand here, kind of cradling it. Uh, and if you'll notice that he also has this kind of uh, toe-gate robe that's draped around his uh, lower portion of his body, and his upper chest is exposed, uh, very much a divine symbolism uh, at this time period. And here we have on a coin, a roughly contemporaneous coin of Alexander, uh, this is the reverse, and this is uh, Zeus himself, again, holding his scepter uh, with the eagle characteristic of Zeus and seated on his throne. And you'll notice that uh, how we can tell the difference between Alexander and Zeus. Uh, we have all of these similar iconographic elements that uh, basically say Alexander is Zeus. However, you'll notice his very typical, prototypical hair that is very much a part of his um, of his kind of signature look. He has this youthful flowing locks uh, that are, you know, absolutely amazing. You know, everyone wants to 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 be to be him with his hair. Um, now Alexander uh, essentially starts to, to cultivate this association with Zeus. Uh, and after a visit to the uh, the kind of oracle of Amun, so Amun, the, the sun god of which we have talked about with Amun Hotep, uh, so he visits this oracle, and the oracle says that he is the son of Zeus. So he be kind of takes on this uh, this role as being the son of Zeus Amun. And looking then to some of his representations. Uh, particularly on his coins, he takes on this uh, this hor this ram's horn, and that ram's horn is very much traditionally associated with the Egyptian god Amun. So he it, himself grows this horn and kind of takes on the guise of a god himself. Now these horns also have a connection to what we saw with those Assyrian deities, how they had the horned helmet. So he's kind of taking all of these different uh, kind of iconographic styles, both from Egypt and from uh, Mesopotamia, and melding them together into a uh, singular form. And you can see here just some more representations of his beautiful locks. And this, uh, with a few other iconographic elements, really becomes the hallmark of the Alexandrian image as to people who display themselves as Alexander uh, essentially take on this type of hair uh, in association with this diadem and the very youthful face. You'll notice he's, he's depicted without a beard. He has this youthful uh, face. And mind you, he conquered the world when he was essentially conquered the world when he was 22, 23, uh, and finished conquering the world essentially at 32. So uh, that makes me feel a bit bad with my age and that uh, I haven't done as much as he has. So who exactly was Alexander the Great? He was the son of Philip II of Macedon uh, and born approximately around 356 BCE. Uh, and after the assassination of his father, Philip, he was essentially proclaimed king by his army. And uh, he eventually dies in Babylon after his campaigns in India, uh, where his body is then transferred to Alexandria. It was on its way from Babylon to Macedonia for him to be buried in his homeland. But the Ptolemies, of whom we'll get to in a little bit, essentially seize his body and bring it to Alexandria to kind of really appropriate his imagery. Now two important battles that really signify the, the, the coming of Alexander are the Battle of Isis uh, and the Battle of Gaugamela, which are basically the two major defeats of the Achaemenid army that essentially signal its downfall. They are both absolutely uh, crushing defeats for the Achaemenids that really threw them onto their heels and they essentially were unable to recover from it. So what we really start to see uh, with this idea of, of Alexander taking on 
uh, this, this kind of godly garb uh, comes from Plutarch. Uh, and when, when Lysippus, the, that very famous sculpture, uh, sculptor, first modeled a portrait of Alexander with his face to turn upwards toward the sky, just as Alexander himself was accustomed to do, uh, turning his neck gently to one side, someone inscribed, not inappropriately, the following epigram. The bronze statue seems to proclaim, looking at Zeus, I place the earth under my sway, you, O Zeus, keep Olympus. So this is where you get that very, uh, that the, the second uh, really typical depiction of Alexander where he has his head kind of slightly cocked and he's looking up to the skies. And this is very much a uh, style that is appropriated and used by a, a plethora of these later Hellenistic kings to symbol, uh, symbolize their, their connection to Alexander and his godhood. And Lysippus, that very famous sculptor, uh, makes uh, a absolutely a ton of sculptures of Alexander. And unfortunately, all of these are essentially lost. And what we're left with are these Roman copies of a Lysippan original. Uh, so most of the statues of, Agath er, of uh, Alexander that we're going to see are basically uh, Roman copies that were made in the first century BC up into the second, third century CE. So looking then at a uh, coin of Alexander, this is uh, struck by Lysimachus of Thrace, one of the earliest depictions of Alexander. Uh, and he was really responsible for establishing the conventions of royal portraiture for the rest of the Hellenistic world. Uh, and he's depicted here youthful and clean shaven. So just as I mentioned, he's, he's unlike me, I guess, because I, I have a beard. And anyway, uh, and he has those kind of beautiful waving locks uh, that cast kind of uh, over his, his upper end of his forehead and kind of intertwine with those horns of Amun. Uh, you can see the diadem streamers that pull off of the back, that other symbol of kingship that is very much important to those, uh, to those kings of the Hellenistic world. And uh, like I said, he was uh, basically proclaimed a son of Zeus at that sanctuary of Amun at Egypt. Uh, and you can see on the reverse of this coin, we have another very kind of typical, uh, essentially a very typical scene uh, of these uh, coins of the Hellenistic empires, uh, in which we have uh, the goddess Athena and Nike, so Nike, the god of victory or goddess of victory, uh, and Athena here. Uh, which are essentially very much these, um, I can't seem to get the laser pointer to disappear, interesting. Uh, so uh, Athena being kind of that, uh, the, the goddess of war and, and victory, and you can see here that uh, Nike kind of crowns the name of Lysimachus, oops, I almost pointed to my screen, <laughs> you can't see that, uh, of Lysimachus here, uh, written in Greek, gives the laurel crown. So again, that uh, another version essentially of the diadem gives the laurel crown to Lysimachus. And uh, the shield here has that lion's head, uh, basically I'm um, referring to the exploits of Hercules and uh, the other depictions of uh, Alexander as Hercules. Again, he was uh, claiming his descent, his, his uh, actual kind of genealogical descent to Hercules as well. So again, kind of working, uh, we see here Lysimachus of Thrace, one of those smaller Hellenistic kingdoms that arise after the death of Alexander. Uh, Lysimachus here is trying to, to use those known portraits of Alexander to connect himself with this broader kind of iconography that's associated with the uh, importance of Alexander himself and his godhood. So looking then to the Battle of Issus, uh, this is one of those, this is essentially the first major victory for uh, the Macedonians and Greeks over the Persian Empire, over the Achaemenids. And uh, as you can see here from 
uh, this lovely gif from the movie uh, Alexander, which was released in 2004, I think, that uh, combines a bunch of battles together, uh, particularly Isis and uh, Galgamela, uh, into one major battle scene. Uh, but it's a fun thing. You can actually kind of see the, uh, the hoplite infantry with their phalanxes, uh, very typical of the Greek time period. Uh, so what happens here is this was a, uh, Alexander was definitely known as one of those absolutely uh, brilliant military generals. What happens is that they, uh, essentially the Persians under Darius III and the Greeks under Alexander come to a head uh, about seven miles south of the city of Issus in Anatolia. Uh, and this is where modern day kind of Turkey and Syria meet at that little point in the Mediterranean. Uh, and what happens is that Darius III sends his heavy cavalry over the, the river to uh, fight against some of the infantry of Alexander. And Alexander's infantry essentially pulls back and draws the, cavalry, the, the heavy cavalry of the Persians into a uh, essentially untenable situation where they won't have enough time to be able to return back to their own lines to help any sort of breach that happens over here. And Alexander takes his cavalry and heavy infantry and essentially comes up and punches straight through these Greek mercenaries that were fighting for, Al uh, for Darius III and essentially completely and utterly breaks the line of the, of the Persians. And with that breakage of the line, they see Darius essentially flees and he runs away. And the, the rest of the army, who was still very much uh, holding back the Greeks and may have actually won this battle, but Darius III flees, and the Greeks then uh, essentially overrun the rest of the enemy because they essentially uh, flounder and uh, basically get into an, uh, a full rout and a full retreat. And it said that as Alexander was chasing Darius III across the field of battle, they crossed a ravine that was uh, normally so deep that a man would have to get off his horse in order to cross it. But it was so full of Persian bodies that they were able to ride right across the top of it. And what is uh, really fascinating here is that we have a depiction of such a battle. Again, a Roman copy of a Hellenistic original. But here you see Alexander in all of his glory, even in the midst of battle, cocking his head to the side and looking up as he's coming with his spear in his hand and defeating all of these Persian soldiers. And you'll notice that this is something that becomes uh, very typical of later depictions, especially in the Roman imperial period, of these Persian peoples as to, they're essentially always wearing pants. Uh, to the Romans, pants were the kind of uh, penultimate, the pinnacle uh, symbol of a barbarian. Uh, and all barbarians essentially wore pants. Only civilized people didn't wear pants. So uh, that's something that we start to even see this trope here uh, from Pompeii. And you'll see uh, just the composition of this piece is, is absolutely extraordinary. There's a, a certain amount of, of depth to it that is uh, really fascinating. You can actually see uh, in this shield, this, this lovely bronze shield, the reflection of one of the falling men in it. Uh, so this kind of self-reflexivity between uh, inanimate objects and the people themselves. And look at the amount of uh, action that's incorporated into the horses and their, their sort of uh, realistic depiction that really kind of gets to, the, to the, the, the clamor and the confusion of battle. And you'll even see that some of the Persians are looking backwards as part of the, the utmost confusion from the route that Alexander put onto the, the Persian enemy. So, uh, what's really fascinating uh, with this 
is if we look a bit closer at this copy of a Hellenistic original, we see that Alexander is garbed in the very kind of conventional Roman armor. So that's something we could get into uh, later on with how the Romans appropriated Hellenistic imagery to be able to, to essentially link themselves with Alexander the Great. But what we have here is this so-called uh, Aegis. Uh, and the Aegis is this sort of kind of uh, bumpy goat skin uh, that is kind of this, this very much associated with the gods uh, and uh, a kind of a royal uh, divine garb uh, with this gorgon head in the center. And uh, those of you who have heard of the gorgons before, uh, this is uh, essentially Medusa was a gorgon. So these were sort of uh, kind of apotropaic devices. Uh, there were these wards against evil and uh, bad things happening to you because if evil were to come to you, uh, these gorgon heads would see them and essentially turn them uh, to stone. So you can see kind of the, the representation of the snakes for hair uh, kind of slithering around here in the mosaic itself. And again, you'll see that Alexander has his head slightly cocked and he's looking upward uh, just as, he's, as if he's talking with Zeus. Uh, and you'll notice here that he has a, uh, a kind of a useful partial beard. And that has more to do with Roman idiom than it does with how Alexander himself was actually portrayed. Uh, and this was uh, very much connected with the early Romans who had that kind of youthful uh, beard. So if you want to learn more about that, you can take a Roman art class from uh, our department when it's offered. So just a little bit about mosaics, um, because we'll definitely be getting uh, more mosaics coming on. Uh, essentially, there are these small tesserae that are made of various materials. So very similar to what we saw with those cone uh, mosaics, uh, how you have different material that is then placed uh, into this uh, sort of setting bed uh, made generally of gypsum or uh, lime plaster that then has these different uh, strati below them to be able to create a, a solid wall or a solid floor. And all of these different little uh, tessera are essentially, uh, can be different colored. They can be made of glass, limestone, marble, uh, but they're used and cut into to various shapes uh, to be able to create a beautiful uh, pattern. Um, so just a, that's a little bit about mosaics to, in case you had no idea uh, about mosaics because they are absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that um, I study as part of my PhD research, uh, they're absolutely fascinating and incredibly frustrating to make. So Alexander has now essentially died. Uh, and we need to, to really understand how the generals left uh, after the death of Alexander started to, to formulate their own ideas of kingship. So first, uh, in this lecture, we're going to be looking at the Ptolemaic uh, Empire, but we need to see uh, some of those other uh, the other empires just to kind of situate ourselves uh, in time. So uh, one of the, the first ones to really kind of uh, come out of these wars of the successors, the Diadochoi, uh, essentially is Antigonus Monophthalmus and his son Demetrius Polyarchates. Now these are perhaps the two coolest uh, cognomens of the entire, uh, basically the entire Hellenistic world. So uh, Antigonus Monophthalmus was, uh, the Monophthalmus essentially means the one-eyed. So he had one eye and uh, that he lost during battle. And that's how he got his name. So he's, he's Antigonus the one-eyed, which is such a cool, badass name. And his son, Demetrius Polyarchates, is Demetrius the siege maker. So that's another absolutely awesome name, the siege maker. I mean, I wish I could have done something, you know, cool enough to be able to get siege maker as uh, part of the name, Jonathan siege maker. That would be 
I would I would very much like very much like that. So what happens is that Antigonus essentially takes on the title Basileus, uh, which is Greek for king, and this was essentially the first step towards the the dissolution of all of these I uh, of all of these successors. Is that by Antigonus taking on this name uh, or on this title, king, uh, it changes that geopolitical uh, relationship between uh, the the uh, Antigonids, the Ptolemids, and the Seleucids, as to where he essentially claims, "I am king," and this really sets off uh, a huge. Um, a huge essentially arms race to be able to grab as much land as possible and be able to defeat uh, the other successors in order to uh, kind of claim your primacy and your your legitimate right to rule under Alexander. So the three kingdoms, as I just mentioned, are the Antigonids, uh, founded by Antigonus the first, Monothalmus, the Seleucids, who are depicted here in the green, and they are uh, the ones that we'll spend the most time on, as far as the uh, as far as the Hellenistic emperor, uh, empires go, uh, and they essentially control almost all of Western Western Asia. They move deep into Asia Minor, and have a rather long history. Uh, only the Ptolemids uh, last longer than the Seleucids, and the Ptolemaic uh, kingdom. They essentially take over the the kind of downfall of Pharaonic Egypt, which had been controlled by the Achaemenids up until the coming of Alexander, and they were started by Ptolemy the First Soter. So uh, Ptolemy takes on the name Savior, uh, Seleucus takes on the name Victor Nicator, and uh, Antigonus, as we said, takes on the One-Eyed. So all pretty awesome names. So what makes a Hellenistic king? There is, I, the, the list here essentially is something that really kind of I, persists throughout the entirety of these Hellenistic kingdoms as to where we get this kind of I, set of iconographic elements that then are used throughout the remainder of the Hellenistic kingdoms in order to, to kind of legitimize their rule. And uh, as we get further on into the Hellenistic kingdoms, uh, these symbols become more and more uh, part of the actual kingdom itself. So the diadem uh, towards the end of the Seleucid Empire is no longer just a symbol of connection to Alexander, but is very much a symbol of Western Asian kingship in and of itself because it had been used for so long. So we have the diadem, again, that little cloth strip that comes around the back and is tied in a lovely little bow, and we'll definitely see a lot more of that later on in the semester. Uh, the wearing of purple, so just like the Roman emperors, purple was still incredibly hard uh, to manufacture. Uh, you know, you crush those little, those little uh, sea snails, I believe it is, and uh, you can make very small amounts of purple and it smells absolutely horrible, but purple again, very much reserved for the, the great Hellenistic kings. The carrying of the spear, again, uh, the association with Zeus, uh, kind of that scepter spear type thing, and again, sitting on thrones. So we saw that earlier with the uh, Roman painting, uh, that copy of a Greek original, and with that coin type of Zeus seated. And of course, divine attributes. So wearing the lion skin, the Nemean lion, as Hercules does. So and you can see a portrait of Alexander here with his lion skin. And the horns, as we talked about, here is a Seleucid coin of Seleucus I, and you can see that the horn is, uh, again, incorporated here. And what's really fascinating is that the lion skin uh, essentially changes from the lion skin at the start of these Hellenistic empires and turns into the elephant skin. So they wear an elephant's head on their head. Uh, so obviously the elephant has been scaled down dramatically because it would be 
very unwieldy to wear a elephant's head on your head. But uh, again, they kind of take that idea because elephants, elephants are very much a uh, Asian uh, association with India and the elephants that are then imported into Persia. And that becomes a, a kind of a symbol of he is not only the king over Greece, mainland Greece and Anatolia, but he's also the king over Asia. And that really is what Alexander becomes, is the king of Asia. And it's left to his successor, the Diadochoi, uh, in order to, to kind of fulfill this idea of kind of pan-Asian kingship. So Alexander, uh, as this, this quote says, um, in, uh, uh, becomes essentially this very important um, person. And he essentially gains his power by virtue of his, his quote unquote divine ancestry. And kind of by the fact that he himself was a god uh, to all of the subsequent Hellenistic monarchs. Uh, and what's really interesting is that the Antigonid, so under Demetrius and uh, Antigonus, is essentially this idea of kind of divine right to rule uh, doesn't really take hold for them. They incorporate images of Alexander to, to further their reign, but they're not, uh, go, they don't go to the full extent that the Ptolemids or the Seleucids do. And just to talk uh, uh, a little bit more about these Antigonids, um, what's really interesting is uh, this kind of interplay between the, the Antigonids not really calling themselves a god, but also in a way making themselves gods, uh, as this hymn here says, for the other gods are far away or have not ears or don't exist or he does not at all. But you we see before us, not made of wood or stone, but real. And so we pray to you. Now this was something that was very much out of the ordinary for the Greeks to be able to, to, to pray to a living person. Divine figures were not uh, so much thought of as having once lived uh, amongst people. The heroes were, so uh, like Hercules, he was a hero who was a mortal man who then kind of becomes deified. But what we see here is this kind of shift after the death of Alexander as to where the Antigonids start to play with this idea of switching between both being gods on earth and being just standard Greek kings. And uh, that is very much uh, kind of associated with what's coming out of Egypt as to the cult of the living pharaoh was something that was very much a part of everyday Egyptian religious practice, which was then kind of brought up into the uh, mainland Greece and Macedonia as part of the Antigonid uh, kind of religious ideology. And I... Uh, Moving on, we see uh, here how these uh, portraits of Alexander essentially move into uh, the later portraits that we have under the Antigonids, Seleucids, and Ptolemaic dynasty. So here are kind of the three main coin types of Alexander. We have Alexander as Hercules, with his elephant headdress. So again, you can see the with the, the Nemean lion as Alexander as Hercules with the lion. And then we have Alexander as Hercules with the elephant skin. And again, what's really fascinating here is you have uh, a representation in a way of the Aegis, the, uh, that kind of royal cloak uh, with its modeled appearance being incorporated into the elephant's skin. And you'll see here that standard uh, coin type of Alexander with his ram's horns that curl around and his beautiful lovely locks. You can see them uh, peeking out, just kind of barely coming out as a, a beautiful locks of hair. And here he's kind of in his full glory with his almost kind of pseudo mullet. Uh, and you'll also notice that we have the diadem streamers here. The diadem is invisible on this one because the uh, elephant head and the 
why and skin both kind of occlude that diadem. And that is then transferred into the later uh, emperors with the uh, antagonists. Here you can see that continue of the uh, of the horn, that horn of Amun. We have the diadem here and a representation of Alexander's hair, just kind of these beautiful flowing locks. You can again see that that young face with a very small chin and slightly flushed cheeks with a, a very prominent nose and large open eyes. And uh, the Seleucids, again, more. this is a more warlike image. He has a uh, traditional Greek helmet on, uh, and we still have those horns and these wings of Apollo here. And we'll talk a bit more about that when we get to the Seleucids as they kind of take on uh, Apollo as one of their patron deities. But again, notice that you have a very uh, a youthful, stern face with, with well-defined lips and a severe nose with these very piercing eyes and a high brow ridge. And under the Ptolemaic dynasts, you see a slightly different adaptation of these uh, of the image of Alexander as to where we have the continuation of the diadem with its streamers and that flowing hair, but the coin portrait is more closely uh, resemblance, has bears a more close resemblance to the actual Ptolemy the first, as to where it's slightly more flush, he's a bit chubby, uh, the nose is more hooked, uh, the lips are slightly set black with the more protrusion of the chin and kind of the the second chin down here into the Adam's apple. And you'll notice that the eyes are slightly more hooded on the outside with not as prominent of a brow ridge. So, uh, but we do have a continuation of that Aegis uh, down here. So still uh, working within that same uh, iconographic uh, repertoire, but incorporating more of his own uh, features into the coin types as to where the Antigonids and the Seleucids very much rely heavily on the portrait types of Alexander. So moving into Ptolemaic Egypt, after Alexander's death, Ptolemy, one of his generals, essentially goes to Egypt and takes it over. Uh, and he makes himself and uh, his son, uh, Ptolemy II, the kings of Egypt in 305, 304. So following uh, the proclamation of the Antigonids as Basileus, they do so as well. And the Ptolemies look both to Greece and to Egypt to uh, essentially make their uh, rule legitimate. And we'll see that uh, that definite interplay between Egyptian ideas and Greek ideas coming together uh, and uh, at the same time remain very much separate types of images in order to speak to these multiple audiences. And the uh, early Ptolemies, so Ptolemy the first, Ptolemy the second, uh, very much tried to expand their empire. Uh, they start, they fought uh, many battles trying to get as much of Egypt as possible and as much of the Levant and uh, uh, kind of Arabia as they could in order to, to secure their place uh, as one of the great Hellenistic empires. So the representations that we see of the Ptolemaic dynasty is essentially uh, all of these, these kind of a spectrum of from Egyptian on one side to Holy Greek and Hellenistic on the other. And their images kind of uh, move between these. Uh, and um, what we have is kind of this idea that um, their intended audience is both looking to, to be able to speak to the Greek inhabitants of Egypt and the Greek inhabitants of the Seleucid Empire and the Antigonids in Greece. So they're able to, to be able to speak across a wide array of um, different Greek speaking and Greek culture, cultural people across a wide uh, swath of land. 
but then they also have these Egyptian uh, kind of ornaments and styles that speak very much to the local Egyptian populace. Uh, as you can see here with the Nemi's headdress of Ptolemy I with the Uraeus coming up, uh, and even the rather large ears that may remind us of some of our statues that we saw constructed out of diorite. So uh, really what we're kind of um, uh, seeing with the Ptolemies is that they're playing with all of these different Egyptian and Greek styles to be able to, to legitimize themselves as both the heirs of Alexander, the heirs of a Hellenistic past and a Greek god's past, but also the heirs of a pharaonic Egyptian past. So one thing that uh, is definitely a question that is, uh, will definitely pop up is why was there seeming very little influence, uh, Egyptian influence on the uh, Greek images that we have from coins? Uh, and essentially being Greek was the ultimate symbol of authority, class, and taste as to where Greek and Greek ideas become this, this kind of larger language, um, as it says here, an international language of, prece of prestige and legitimacy. Uh, and we see this with the once Rome conquers Greece, uh, we start to see the same thing happen with the Roman emperors, is that they take on more and more Greek uh, attributes and Hellenistic attributes that um, they try to use to be able to speak about how you know, important and fancy they are. And uh, one really interesting um, fact is that uh, essentially only Greek males would marry uh, native females. And um, there was a, like the Greek males would still marry Greek females, but there wasn't um, basically the other way around did not occur. Uh, so the kind of Greek masculine identity was very much uh, sort of preserved through this, uh, these interesting marriage types. So they essentially use with the foundation of uh, Alexander is they essentially use Alexander uh, or the foundation of Alexandria, excuse me, they use Alexander being the founder of Alexandria as this kind of, um, you know, person who they can worship and simultaneously connect themselves to. As to if they're of the same lineage of Alexander, and Alexander is worshipped as a god, then of course the Ptolemies are also gods by association. Uh, and this lovely bronze statue of Alexander the Great, uh, here he's portrayed as the founder of Alexandria, uh, and he wears a snake-fringed aegis. So again, that, that uh, lovely like goatskin cloak, and you can kind of see the snakes just along the edges here, um, uh, in the form of this clamis, so this kind of almost poncho-like uh, clothing. Uh, and again, he held uh, a spear in his hand. So again, that's very typical idea of uh, Zeus-related kingship, and a palladium, uh, which is this kind of statuette uh, of Athena in his left hand that is now unfortunately broken off. Uh, so as I mentioned before, that uh, Ptolemy seized the body of Alexander while it was being transported from Babylon to Macedonia uh, and placed it in a shrine known as the Sema uh, in Alexandria. Uh, and it was probably, the shrine at first was probably um, the center of an ordinary hero cult uh, of Alexander. And we'll see this in the Seleucid, uh, the Seleucid Empire, uh, where these temples are built to the founders of cities, these so-called heroons. Uh, and uh, what's kind of really interesting here is that, as I mentioned, uh, they use Alexander's divinity as a way to claim their divine legitimacy and as their uh, kind of divine legitimate successorship uh, to Alexander. Um, and what happens is that Ptolemy I doesn't claim himself to be a god, 
but Ptolemy II kind of goes on to that next level of a uh, kind of godship and we see that under um, with uh, making both Ptolemy I a god and himself a god. And this ruler cult appears to have been a fusion of those Greek hero cults, as I mentioned, uh, like those of Heracles and of city founders, uh, with an institution of sort of political deification. So uh, giving yourself a divine lineage in order to say, well, I am a god, so of course I have a legitimate right to rule and a certain amount of Egyptian ritual solemnity as to where the Egyptians were very much um, used to, to, to these sort of um, ideas of, of worshiping the living pharaoh. So uh, Ptolemy I was the first uh, of the major uh, Hellenistic empires to produce an official portrait of Alexander. And you can see here he is with his elephant headdress being the king of Asia, Asia with his aegis uh, down below, and with a striding forth Athena with spear and shield uh, going to, to wreck some folks uh, in uh, in front of her, uh, just like we saw with uh, with Naram Sin. Uh, but he was also the first to abandon Alexander's image in his own currency. Uh, so uh, just as we mentioned before, is that we see a kind of new idea of making themselves uh, both their own individual image that's augmented by these uh, Alexandrine elements. So we have that Aegis uh, tied around his neck, we have the diadem and the waving hair, but a hair st uh, facial structure that is more closely related to uh, Ptolemy himself. And uh, first he issues only gold coins, so these were coins that would have only been available to the upper, upper echelons of society. Uh, but later on, about five years later, they then come out in silver. So they, the image starts to spread wider. So it seems that Ptolemy was playing with the idea of uh, using his own image on coins and using it in the very upper echelons of society in order to kind of test the waters and see if it, if there was, what the reaction was going to be. And clearly the reaction was, was relatively good because he was then, uh, he then started minting them in silver in order to be able to, to spread his own image further. And again, you see a, another uh, representation here with a pentadrachm. Uh, and we have the, uh, this brilliant, absolutely brilliant uh, depiction of an eagle of Zeus holding the lightning bolt. And this is uh, a good time to talk about uh, the absolute uh, kind of typified idea of the lightning bolt because it will be uh, important in the next lecture, I believe. But you see we have this kind of central rod or staff that is then has these kind of squiggly lightning-like lines. So just like the massive amounts of lightning this morning, I'm recording this on Tuesday uh, and I woke up at I, you know, 5.30, and as I was brushing my teeth, the, the massive booms was, uh, gave me a bit of a start, and I actually stabbed my toothbrush into my gums, and it kind of hurt. Uh, anyway, uh, but yes, so this very typical uh, representation of lightning uh, associated with Zeus is something we will see uh, again and again. And one thing I want to, to mention is that if you are interested in uh, Hellenistic art, I highly recommend uh, this book, Art in the Hellenistic Age by J.J. Pollock. Uh, this is one of the first books that I ever owned as an art historian, uh, and it is absolutely amazing. Uh, so I definitely recommend picking it up if you're interested in learning more about Hellenistic art. And actually there might even be a scanned copy online somewhere that you could probably find, but it's super cheap on Amazon, I believe. Anyway, let us move to the city of Alexandria, where dreams are made of. I, I don't know, that was, that was stupid, I apologize. Uh, so yes, Alexandria, uh, located uh, on the very upper part of Egypt, 
uh, and upper by upper I mean north, so on the Mes Mesopotamian Sea. Uh, and it was founded with this idea of the Hippodamian grid plan. So those ideas of perfectly kind of 90 degree streets, streets founded uh, or thought of by Hippodamus as this way to kind of order cities into blocks and uh, identifiable units. Uh, and you can see here the, the famous library of Alexandria and this uh, this is the best image I could find of a site plan of Alexandria, but it says museum here. Uh, that's, it wasn't a museum in how we actually think about it. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but uh, just be aware of that. Uh, but we have the Tycheum, so a, uh, um, a kind of shrine to Tyche. Uh, we have the Sema, where Alexander's body was, a temple of Isis, uh, Saturn, of course, which is a later Roman edition. Uh, and this appears to be the original part of the Alexandrian town, uh, which was then expanded uh, slightly later under the Ptolemies. And of course, we have the lighthouse, that famous lighthouse of Alexandria that was destroyed around 900 CE with a massive earthquake. Um, so a very uh, prototypical uh, city that you should definitely be aware of. Um, just like in the exam uh, that you just had, uh, there may be some questions on the final exam about city foundation and what cities look like what. So make sure you study this because uh, you, know, you want to remember the Hippodamian grid plan. Uh, where certain of these uh, structures are, uh, and I'll try and find a better map of uh, Alexandria, and I'll post it probably in the next uh, lecture slides. So moving to the Tycheon, this was adjoined to a thing called the Museon, uh, and what this was is the House of the Muses. So yes, it is where we get the term museum from, but we can't think of it as a place where they stored a bunch of statues and modern paintings. They didn't have Rothko's and Pollock's on the walls, uh, but instead we could think of it as a sort of early university where scholars, artists, poets, philosophers all came together and did their artistic thing. Uh, and the Museon itself was kind of this overarching complex that contained the Library of Alexandria. And I, the Tycheon, which unfortunately, with many of the buildings at Alexandria, we have no idea what they actually looked like. Um, we have some descriptions, uh, like Libanius, uh, Libyanus uh, here uh, describes how this, uh, the Tycheon at Alexandria looked, but we don't actually have the, um, the actual plan. Uh, so here, the plan here, uh, it probably was similar to this because we're this is one uh, in Syria that is roughly contemporaneous, but it contained a, a group of monumental statues uh, with the center has Alexander himself, perhaps even a similar statue to this, being crowned by the personification of the earth, uh, Greek ge, uh, and then earth being crowned by Tyche. So of fortune, so fortune crowning the earth, the earth crowning Alexander. And we could even think uh, back to that uh, uh, quote that we had earlier that uh, Alexander says, you know, he says to Zeus that he uh, can take care of the earth while Zeus can take care of the heavens. So you can see kind of a, a connection there. And uh, we also, in the same thing, is that uh, niches, uh, little statue niches, uh, held the statues of the Ptolemies and the Olympian gods. So not only was it uh, the main figure of Alexander being crowned by Earth, being crowned by fortune, but also with the Ptolemies and the Olympian gods all brought into the single uh, structure in order to be able to, um, to all be essentially venerated at the same time. And we do have uh, a little bit more information from the Tyche of Antioch and the Tycheum of Antioch, which uh, was this uh, kind of pillared hall with a central arcuated lintel uh, in which the statue of Tyche herself was uh, present. And uh, the traditional representation of Tyche was uh, with this kind of mural crown, a walled crown. Uh, which represented kind of the fortune of protection of the city. Uh, the shafts of wheat 
which is kind of the fortune of kind of fertility and good and bringing food and generally depictions of the river. So here is a depiction of the Orontes, uh, a personification of the Orontes. Uh, that was um, the river in which Antioch, the famous Antioch, was located on. Uh, here uh, is the uh, potential banquet hall, which was described uh, relatively in depth by multiple uh, ancient authors, uh, as it appears to have been this kind of large central covered courtyard with this upper portico that wrapped around it. And uh, it was again attached to the museum uh, as part of that larger complex. And some of the famous people who have st who studied at the museum are Archimedes, that father of engineering, uh, Callimachus, that poet, um, Aristophanes, the guy who said the earth is spherical and he calculated the circumference by measuring two obelisks, uh, Euclid, that famous geometrician, uh, and uh, Hipparchus, who was the founder of trigonometry. So all of these very famous people that really revolutionized the world of science uh, and poetry and scholarship uh, were all uh, here at Alexandria. One of the other major things that was uh, kind of instituted this is that so-called uh, the Ptolemaea, uh, which was started in 279 BCE and was held to honor Ptolemy I, so started under Ptolemy II uh, as a sort of savior god, hence Ptolemy I Soter. Uh, and this it was a sort of Isolympic game. So Isolympic means same as the games in Olympia. So same as the Olympics, uh, where they had athletic competitions where people were running and wrestling and throwing discs and grabbing onto each other. Uh, yeah, throwing discs, grabbing onto each other, maybe hitting each other with dish plates and playing a pan flute, doing all those, you know, things associated traditionally with the Olympics as, as you're wont to do and uh, huge sacrifices involved. So massive sacrifices of animals in which everyone got to have a little piece of meat, uh, probably a fun time all around, uh, and a huge procession uh, that was very much uh, Greek in character. So something that comes out of Greek and uh, later on, essentially, uh, we can kind of see the remnants of this in the Roman triumphal procession. Uh, and this quote from Gertz, uh, Clifford Gertz in 1983, uh, is quite applicable to this, uh, to locate the society center and affirm its connection with transcendent things, stamping a territory with ritual signs of dominance. So by holding these very Greek games in the, the heart of administrative Egypt, really speaks to the dominance of that Greek culture and the importance of being Greek in a non-Greek land was to the Ptolemies. Another major structure was the so-called Serapeion, uh, which was dedicated to Serapis, who was a fusion of the Osiris cult, the bull Apis, uh, who's the son of Hathor, uh, and Hades. Uh, and it was really kind of meant to unify the aspects of Egyptian and Hellenistic religions. Uh, and uh, Serapis takes on the visual aspects of Zeus, uh, and it was considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. And, excuse me, like basically everything else of uh, of ancient Alexandria, don't know what it looked like. Now the Sema, uh, as I mentioned before, was the burial place of Alexander. I uh, again location unknown, but this was where his body was his body was brought with this lovely 18th century representation of Alexander's uh, giant sarcophagus mobile tomb structure, uh, but uh, it's where the body was placed and there seems to have been a cult that grew around this in addition to the Tycheon. And of course we have to mention the so-called the Pharos of Alexandria, the lighthouse, that famous lighthouse, approximately 338 feet high and 98 foot square base. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, there was a massive underwater uh, 
kind of survey of the site in which huge blocks of granite that were from 49 to 60 tons were found, uh, 30 sphinxes, five obelisks, and columns and carvings dating all the way back to Ramses II, so a bit of spoliation in order to connect the uh, Ptolemaic kings with the pharaohs. Uh, in all, they cataloged over 3,300 pieces of individual elements that came from the lighthouse of Alexandria. Uh, absolutely incredible. And here's a picture of one of the columns that's all barnacled up. I, I wonder if there's a pineapple somewhere down there. SpongeBob. Anyway, we also see an engagement by the Ptolemies with traditional architecture. And obviously, we can compare these uh, pylons from the sanctuary of Isis at Philae uh, with those of Luxor and Karnak. And basically, looking at them from afar, you really couldn't tell uh, the difference uh, between a Egyptian temple constructed during the Ptolemies and one constructed under, say, Ramses I. Uh, and this uh, sanctuary of Isis received pilgrims from all over the Hellenistic world. And the cult of Isis endured deep into late antiquity until its eventually eventual dwindling uh, after the adoption of Christianity in the fourth century Roman Empire. Another site is this so-called the Temple of Sobek and Haroeris, uh, a sort of guise of, um, of Horus at Kamambo. Uh, and you can see here that we have a very much these traditional uh, Egyptian symbols with this sort of pseudo cabeto lotus cornice, those winged sun discs with the uraeus, uh, and these beautiful kind of budding lotus capitals that are also slightly uh, Corinthian type capitals with the acanthus leaves in nature. Uh, and uh, here is a depiction of Ptolemy the Six Philometor. Uh, with a very traditional Egyptian crown depicted very much in a Egyptian style, so kind of fusing uh, those styles together. Uh, here again we have Ptolemy the Sixth with Horus and Hathor, uh, again using those very traditional uh, elements, the triple Atef crown here, uh, using these traditional elements of Greek uh, and Egyptian culture kind of fused together. So using uh, these Egyptian motifs that we've seen time and time again, I uh, slightly modified with Greek facial features and I uh, brought into this idea of an Egyptian uh, temple. So looking here at the Temple of Horus that was constructed, uh, constructed much later in the Ptolemaic Empire, uh, again very much uh, basically standard uh, pylon type architecture. We have the cabeto with this Uraeus uh, motif here in the wings uh, and the various gods and of course smiting of enemies. You can't go wrong with some enemy smiting in ancient Egypt. So here we have Ptolemy the 12th smiting his enemies uh, and very similar to so many things we've seen before uh, from Egypt and obviously compare it to the palette of Narmer uh, holding the people's heads and uh, with a bird looking on and kind of giving you the A-OK. -okay. And here, just a fun little thing, uh, is the cartouche of Alexander the Great. So uh, now you can know Alexander's cartouche, and this was located at the Temple of Luxor. So moving a little bit to the coins in the final part of our lecture today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the iconography uh, that we see here. So here is a coin of Ptolemy the First Soter. We've seen it uh, before on the, uh, the some terms that you should know is the obverse, O-B-V-E-R-S-E, is the, is the heads, and the reverse is the tails. Uh, so here we have on the obverse uh, a kind of portrait image of Ptolemy the uh, first with his diadem, Alexandrian type hair, and his uh, aegis, that uh, famous garb that we've talked about so far, mm -hmm. uh, so much so, so far. Uh, and on the reverse, we have Alexander in a chariot holding the thunderbolt of Zeus. Uh, and uh, of course, without a shirt on because you know all the gods don't wear shirts. 
and being pulled by these massive elements, again, the kind of king of, uh, of Asia. And on the backside in Greek, we have Ptolemyu uh, Basileu. Basileus, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so Ptolemy king or of the king Ptolemy. Uh, looking at, then at some of the other uh, coins that came out with uh, Ptolemy the first, we have the Athena types with that Spartan helmet, uh, made famous by uh, 300, uh, that coin that we've seen so far, and that Alexander type with the elephantine head. Uh, replicative of Heracles, but as Alexander is conqueror of Asia. And again, uh, seeing a similarity with that Aegis, but the different facial types uh, you can see here with this a bit more severe droopy eyes, uh, a bit more of a hooked nose being deployed by Ptolemy. Now under Ptolemy II, he deifies his father, uh, Ptolemy the first, first and mother Berenike, uh, and uh, basically makes them gods in and of themselves. Uh, so here we have Ptolemy I and Berenike with the inscription Theon, so God above them. Uh, and shortly thereafter, he deifies himself and his wife Arsinoe as the sibling gods, so a Delphon. And I, essentially, this is where we see the rise of the Ptolemies as kings. Uh, so here we see uh, Ptolemy II and Arsinoe II uh, with his diadem and a clamys, uh, no longer the Aegis, but just a clamys. Uh, and um, we see a uh, veil that just barely kind of comes around uh, her head. Here you can just see the indication of it here uh, with a small cornucopia down at the bottom. Uh, and on the back side, uh, we have a, uh, a Galatian shield with a thunderbolt, so indicative of Zeus. And of course, this dotted border that is very prototypical of all of the, um, all of the, uh, the coins that we see essentially. And of course, this is Delphon, uh, meaning sibling gods. Uh, and on the back side, we have Ptolemy and uh, Ptolemy I and Berenike. Again, very similar uh, construction. Uh, we have that uh, diadem and a cloak and a slightly less uh, uh, chubby face than what we see with Ptolemy II. So much more useful than how his father and mother are depicted here. And again, his mother, Berenike, wearing that veil as well. Looking then to Ptolemy III, uh, and this one being struck under Ptolemy IV in the early part of Ptolemy IV's reign, uh, follows the precedent of Ptolemy II with that chubby, chubby youthful face, uh, but adding a rayed crown with a trident, uh, Neptune, with a lotus bud in the center, so kind of a connection of Neptune and Egypt, uh, with a cornucopia uh, on, the, on the reverse as a symbol of abundance, and it is uh, with a rayed diadem, uh, marked again here on uh, Ptolemy III's head, uh, and on the cornucopia uh, with various fruits and cakes and little fun things coming out, and of course the diadem streamers. Um, so we see kind of a, a progression uh, of these coin types uh, from the kind of severe, more old-looking portraits of Ptolemy I to the divinity of Ptolemy II and being a little bit more chubby uh, to kind of the, the full Monty here with Ptolemy III, uh, who has that raid crown symbol of uh, kind of divine radiance and glory, uh, and then incorporating the Aegis, just as we've seen so many times before, and this trident with lotus bud speaking both to the Egyptian and the Greek crowds. But the entire uh, kind of motifs here very much speak to a Greek precedent. So that concludes today. Um, make sure that you, uh, if you have anything that you want to talk about uh, from the previous exam, or of course from anything we talked about in this lecture, you put it into the discussion section. 
I, and that is basically all I have. So hopefully I, Wednesday when you're watching this is slightly nicer and you have a great rest of your week and uh, I will see you all on Monday. Have a good one.